We begin today in 1992, and just the Christmas before, the hammer and sickle had lowered for the last time in Russia. At the start of the year, Deng Xiaoping went on his southern tour, a last hurrah as the true wielder of power in China before Jiang Zemin took over. And then in June, the governor of Arkansas captivated an entire nation by playing the saxophone. I probably don't need to tell you that that governor was Bill Clinton, and for the first time in decades, America had a truly charismatic candidate. Not to mention that Clinton had figured out the only sentiment that truly swings the vote. We believe in the importance of fundamentals in our economy. You would have thought that having had a half-century Cold War end under his watch, the Bush was a shoe in for the next re-election campaign. But he was smashed. And not only was Bush defeated, but Clinton campaigned on a much tougher policy towards China. As far as Clinton was concerned, Bush had simply been too nice to the Middle Kingdom. Hello there. Okay, so as we get into Sino-US relations in the Clinton era, it's hard to overstate the implications that the fall of the Soviet Union had on the relationship between China and the USA throughout the 90s. The fact that the Soviet Union was the primary threat to both China and America gave them strategic glue. With that enemy now neutralized, America really needed to rethink what its interests actually were in China. For China, on the other hand, it was clear what its interests were in America. America had been a huge customer of China's, and by 1992, America had a trade deficit of 18.3 billion US dollars with them. From a strategic point of view, losing 18.3 billion dollars worth of manufacturing jobs to China wasn't a huge issue prior to the fall of the Soviet Union. The cheap Chinese manufacturing allowed many US companies to profit, and a strong China that was a manufacturing powerhouse was a useful ally against the USSR. Come 1992, however, Clinton was looking at a system of government that was vastly different to America's, and that was growing rapidly. If trajectories were to stay as they were, a new Cold War enemy would simply take the place of the Soviets. And given that Bush could boast of the Cold War ending under his watch, Clinton had a pretty limited hand of where to hit him in terms of foreign policy. Ultimately, Clinton opted to hit Bush on China, particularly that Bush was not punitive enough in the wake of the Tiananmen Square massacre, and that he turned a blind eye to human rights violations. You can learn more about it here. And this would be the lane that Clinton would stick to. He was willing to talk with China, but under his watch, China would be pressured towards a better human rights record. And in terms of a positive relationship between the two, the first few years under Clinton looked grim, as Clinton sought to use China's most favoured nation status as a bargaining chip. Basically, if a country is given most favoured nation status, that country cannot be discriminated against in trade deals with things like tariffs. You usually need to be part of the World Trade Organization to gain most favoured nation status, but China was not yet part of the WTO, meaning that they were given MFN status, which would be reviewed and then renewed each year. It's pretty much the opposite of this. You are not on this council, but we grant you the rank of master. How can you be a master and not be on the council? Do not take a seat, young Skywalker. Clinton effectively used this yearly renewal as a bargaining chip to press China on human rights issues such as free emigration, adherence to the UDHR, the releasing of all political prisoners, freedom of religion, and protecting the cultural heritage of Tibet. China said no and relations got worse when in 1995, due to the pressure of Congress, Clinton allowed Taiwanese President Li Tunghui to make a private visit to the US. And as you can imagine, China was furious with such recognition. Oh, damn, this chicken is good. My compliments to the staff. Right? <laughs> what? What's, that? What's happening? China responded by mounting a series of military exercises that included testing missiles near Taiwan, to which America replied by deploying two carrier groups near to Taiwan. By Clinton's re-election the following year, things were starting to look a little bit better. America hosted Chinese Defense Minister Chi Hoshin in December 1996, and the following year China signed all sorts of treaties such as the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Chemical Weapons Convention, and the Biological Weapons Convention. I can name Kung Flu. In return, the US agreed to support China's application to the WTO. 1997 was also an important year because China's new head of state, Jiang Zemin, visited the USA for the first time since Deng Xiaoping had given him the reins. And the visit was met with a fair amount of protest. For example, actor Richard Gere, that's this Buddhist guy from the Simpsons episode where Lisa gets into Buddhism, led a protest against China's occupation of Tibet. There were, however, a number of supporters of Jung's in attendance, and in fairness, the meeting between Jung and Clinton was actually pretty substantive. I'll link the hour-long press conference below for anyone who's keen, but here's Mr. Mitchell's snapshot. In terms of a strategic relationship, a direct hotline was set up between Washington and Beijing, 
What's her address? 117 Von Bergen Street. Hello. Hey, Ryan. Both Jung and Clinton agreed to press North and South Korea into four-party peace talks, and Clinton basically said that the Taiwan-China issue was something for them to sort out amongst themselves. Jung, however, said that China refused to renounce the possibility of using force when dealing with the Taiwan issue, but clarified that that was not targeted towards Taiwan, but other countries attempting to interfere with the issue. And having attempted to resolve conflicting perspectives on Iran, they made some progress. America was hoping to stop all sales of missiles to Iran, but China agreed not to commit to any new nuclear cooperation with them. In terms of economic matters, the two addressed America's trade deficit and reached an agreement where China would buy 50 Boeing airliners at a value of 3 billion US dollars. As part of its bid to join the World Trade Organization, China also announced its commitment to reduce its tariff to an average of 17%. Now, this was down from 23% in 1996 and 44% in 1993. Finally, when it came to cultural issues, Jiang Zemin had a day to forget. Like I said before, Clinton wanted to run in the lane of being the president who would stand up to China on human rights issues. He labeled them as being on the wrong side of history, to which Jiang likened China's occupation of Tibet to being like the liberation of black slaves in America. Now, in fairness to Jiang, if you read into Tibet's preoccupation history, it was an intense feudal society where 98% of people lived in serfdom and experienced some of the cruelest treatment by landlords imaginable. But the optics of making that comparison looked terrible, and it really came across as quite tone deaf. The US also refused to drop its support for the condemnation of China's Tiananmen Square incident in the Human Rights Convention, and it was also announced that Wei Jingzheng, who had been serving a 14-year prison term, would be released and allowed to leave for the USA. Ultimately, as the millennium came to an end, the Sino-US relationship was in a pretty strong place. Yes, Clinton could posture all he wanted about China's human rights record, but there was an awareness between both parties that this was mainly for optics, and if you look at the policies and agreements, they were as good as ever. With the Soviet Union falling, it wasn't as though mum and dad had to stay together for the kids, there was a very real relationship and a very strategic trade dialogue. And as the world entered a new millennium, China was about to become unstoppable, and America would once again have to rethink their approach. But more on that later. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, don't forget to let me know by hitting the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Let me know in the comment section below who you want to see for next week's episode of Enemies of the West, and we can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.